I'm Monica Olson. And I'm Jennifer Walsh. And you're listening to the Biophilic Solutions Podcast, where every other week we sit down with experts and thought leaders across industries in order to explore the innate connection between humans and nature and why we need nature to thrive. We truly believe that in order to tackle the global environmental problems we're facing, we as humans must reconnect to the natural world and come to a better understanding of how we fit in and how we are so interconnected. So in every episode, we'll interview new guests that help us uncover and highlight nature-based solutions to get us on a path to greater health, tackling climate change, and ultimately getting outside and connecting with nature. So let's get to today's episode. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Monica. All right, Jen, we're covering a lot of ground today, nothing new. So let's dive right in. <laughs> Who are our guests? That's so true. Yes. So today we're speaking with Bill Browning and Katie Ryan from Terrapin Bright Green. They're going to be talking about a new report they just co authored alongside Dakota Walker. It's called The Economics of Biophilia Why Designing with Nature Makes Financial Sense, and it's a second edition. Yeah, we're really excited to have read this. So, the first edition of the report came out about 10 years ago in 2012, and it was really the first time that someone had made the financial case for biophilic design, which, as we know and have explored, is super important. But in this new edition, it takes that initial research and amplifies it with a lot of new post-occupancy studies and good examples to dive into. Yeah, absolutely. And it just came out recently, didn't it? Just maybe in the past few weeks. So this episode's really timely. Yeah. So it came out into September. And so about a month old. And the areas we're going to cover in the report also touch base on things in our past episodes. So like offices, education, retail, hospitality, healthcare, as well as biophilic communities. And one thing that I'll tease before we get into the interview is that the health outcomes of the biophilic design are directly tied to many of the financial benefits, which is something that I love. Yes. And let's get to our interview with Bill Browning and Katie Ryan. Bill, Katie, we're so happy to have you on the Biophilic Solutions Podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Maybe I should say welcome back. (laughs) Well, and you guys have been here before, so it's not your first rodeo. And one of the things that is really exciting and why we really wanted to get you back in a timely manner is you have an incredible report out, The Economics of Biophilia, and it is the second edition. And so I would love to sort of jump right in, maybe give our listeners a little bit of a tidbit on, you know, when the first one was, I think it was six, seven years ago how that first edition was received and then what led you guys to update it. Bill and I actually tell this story quite often. It's that you know, back in 2010, 2011, we're, we're talking about biophilia a lot and people were really attracted to the idea, the concepts and, and some of the science, but there wasn't, there was always this idea of like, well, okay, that's great, but who's going to pay for it? And so as a group, we kind of, realized that we needed to take another course, like another course of action. And Terrapin partner at the time, Chris Garvin said, well, maybe we should write about it. Let's write about the economics of biophilia. So a group of us, there were a lot of people involved, started researching the case. And, you know, we already had a lot of the science, but we tried to create a way that really drew people in to understand why there was a benefit beyond the aesthetics, beyond the cool idea, and try to help them understand why that investment might make sense for them, for their space type, or for their user, you know, their target audience. And then in 2012, we published The Economics of Biophilia. And that kind of was a pivotal moment for us, right, Bill? Like, that's when things really got started. People started showing interest. Yeah, it went from being Oh, isn't that nice? (laughs) Oh, biophilia, that's really nice too. Oh, wow, this is important and there are big numbers attached to it. And so that was really the the point of Mm -hmm. doing this was to help people understand what were the dollars and cents that result from application of biophilia in a variety of different places and spaces. Did you see an interest explode in the past even five years to the first report? Because I feel like it's been out since 2012 or so. But um, I mean, I'm certain that it was really well received in the beginning, but I'm sure even more so, I feel like in the past or five or six years, would you say that would be true? Yeah, we, we tracked it like kind of loosely and start, you know, we would mm-hmm. kind of have this little mini celebration whenever we saw it in some like 
type of media that it hadn't been in before. And I remember Bill found some, I think it was a newspaper from Toronto, maybe, that had a big advertisement for a multifamily building, if I'm not mistaken, that actually, like, one of the big things on there was about biophilia. And somebody paid a lot of money to make that advertisement in the newspaper. And it was a full, <laughs> like, half spread. And so we're like, wow, this has hit mainstream. That was the first time we really acknowledged that it hit. And I don't, that was quite some time ago now, but I would say it, it's been incremental. And then absolutely 2020 hits mm. and people start asking questions and realizing ind- independently, individually of that need for the connection to nature. And so I've seen that there's definitely a more concerted interest, not just in using biophilia, but in understanding what the opportunity is. Yeah, and that wasn't just, mm-hmm, you know, people mm-hmm. stuck at home going, okay, I need to get out in nature or how to bring nature in. But also in, in the pandemic, we really saw how important it was to bring to essential workers as well. And people mm-hmm. who were, you know, had to be at work and had to be in stressful situations and the benefit for them as well. Yeah, I remember really clearly starting to see it where you would expect it first, architecture, pubs, or landscape, magazine. But I remember, Bill, and I don't know, it was one of your other books perhaps was in Dwell and then in Vogue. And when it hit Vogue, I was like, okay, now we're talking like mainstream, if you will. I mean, still, you know, a specific design fashion forward group. But I thought, okay, the world is starting to understand that maybe this biophilia thing isn't just a big quirky word, but something we really have to think about. And I think, Bill, to your point about the metrics, we know corporations, businesses, banks, private equity, they need numbers, right? They have to have the numbers. One of the ways I realized how mainstream it was, was about three months ago, I was reading an article in Architectural Digest and it's describing this house and in the middle of a paragraph is a sentence said, and they added this to the house to support biophilic design. Mm-hmm. No explanation just casually. beyond that, casually. just very casually <laughs> to support biophilic design. It's like, okay, so if they're using it in that context without having to explain it, I think the concept's getting out there somewhat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, and it really, it's a huge, hugely due to you guys and the work you've been doing because 2012, that's 11 years ago, you were in the hinterlands. Yeah. And, you know, the additional the piece of then in... 2014, publishing the 14 patterns of biophilic design that help give sort of definition and and tools to people. Yes. And then in the middle of the pandemic, not good for book tours and promotion, but Katie and I finished a book for the Royal Institute of British Architects, Nature Inside a Biophilic Design Guide. That was really a walk through many different kinds of spaces and and the types of applications in them, plus giving people a bunch of tools for implementation. I mean, in a way, it may have been prophetic because it was nature. You know, know, we were trapped inside. Yeah, but I think it's important to to point out too, though, that many people were already intuitively embracing biophilic design and still do, but they didn't have the language to communicate either why they were drawn to it, whether it's in the built environment, in fashion, in photography, and art, like across all sorts of spectrum, in research and science, like people had already been doing it, but they didn't have a language for it that tied it to other disciplines. And so, you know, we've heard from many people that they had those moments where they would see economics biophilia or 14 patterns of biophilic design or some other publication or article that made them realize, wait, I can justify everything I've been doing because now there is something that kind of brings it all together. And so, a lot of it is that just making those connections. It's not necessarily bringing new ideas. It's just being able to provide a language for people to communicate across this. I'm so glad you're saying that, Katie, because both of you, you and Bill are just, the work that you've done has been so important and so instrumental to so many people because as Monica knows when I started my first business back in 97, I didn't have a name for it. And being able to then go into your work and understand like there, this is it. And then having those patterns described in depth as to how to, how does this impact human health really lays the patterns down for everyone to understand why 
why we know it's good for us, why it's good for the economy, why it's good for community. And saying so, can you kind of give us a breakdown of what those chapters are or those topics? I mean, Monica and I read it, but we'd love for you guys to go into a little bit more about why did you choose those topics to discuss? Mm -hmm. We really wanted to look broadly across a lot of different economic sectors. And one of the things we also realized was there was material that we didn't really cover in the first edition. There are a lot more, obviously there are a lot more examples now than when we wrote the first one, but there are other topics that we wanted to bring in. And so the sectors we would look at are office spaces, education, retail, healthcare, hospitality, and then communities. And we see different results and different impacts in those different sectors. And so we also, one of the things we also did was made sure that the calculations are very apparent to people. So if they want to replicate them, and this time we also added additional tools to help people make the arguments. Because we're finding that a lot of the users of this are designers or others who need to convince the owners or the finance folks or other folks, you know, are interested, but not as attuned to design to why this is important, what the outcomes are. And the outcomes are incredible. I mean, we've talked a lot on the podcast and obviously when we're with you guys about how the improved health and cognitive functioning, even emotional, right? And how that can be such a great economic driver throughout it. Will you Give us a few examples. Maybe we can start with sort of employee or maybe student performance. You know, I think those were some of the healthcare might be something that we can touch on too. I feel like that was one of the earliest studies that I remember reading about. But I'm sort of fascinated with the employee retention and health. And then maybe talk about students. You know, one of the things that we point out about an office building, and this, of course, is the economics are a little bit different now that we don't have the level of occupancy. But when you look at the expense of, an, of a normally occupied office building on, a, on an annual basis, coming from the green building movement, we're always focused on energy costs and carbon and all that, which are really, really important. But if we want to look per square foot at the cost of a building, that energy cost is only about 1% of the total cost of an annual for building. 90% of the cost is the people per square foot. And that includes you know, their salaries, that includes presenteeism, that includes absenteeism. Rent is a little under 10%. So, you know, to flip that around, a 1% gain in productivity is equivalent to your entire energy bill. So, you know, that's something we really, really want to focus on. Last week at the Well Summit, one of the conversations was with several senior folks from the real estate industry talking about return to office and what makes the space desirable to return to office. And they said, yeah, it's not the espresso maker. It's the spatial qualities themselves and the things that that can support and the interactions for the people there. And several of them said, we, you know, we think biophilia is a component of that, that will bring people back and make them want to be in these, be back in offices and back in these spaces. I think the spatial configurations is an interesting thing because you guys talk about, you know, we've talked about it with you a lot, seating with prospect and refuge where you can see out and you also feel like your back is to something. So you feel protected, that that really helps performance and probably people are comfortable, right? They're not worried about who's coming in behind them. They can see the whole office. And then the other one was the direct access to views and or indoor greenery. I feel like I'm seeing more and more buildings that are being built in Atlanta, you know, as they're coming up with outdoor space on all of the levels or these interior courtyards. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, when you were talking to people last week, is that what you were hearing about some of the quote amenities or configurations? When we think about bringing people back to work, we have to remind ourselves that not everyone has access to nature at home or views outside or good daylight or even just a good apartment or home. So when an office space can provide for that, it's a much more appealing place to be. And, and I've been there. I, I mean, through COVID, I went to the office. I was the sometimes the only person in the office, but I went because I wanted to be there. 
because it had fantastic daylight. It had outdoor patios that I didn't have to go on, but I could go on. And I did work out there, not all the time. For me, I actually like was drawn to the office. So I think to be able to provide options is a, a key factor in that. It's like not every place can have outdoor offices or sunrooms because they either don't have access to it, like they just don't have that on site or if it's not practical for other reasons. But when you can provide options for people so that they can move around and choose that thermal condition or that daylighting condition or or the facial qualities or the combination of all those things, then you're really hitting a sweet spot in that, that provision of amenities. I'm sure Bill has more to add on that, especially with regards to the interface project, which really capitalizes on that and does a great job. So one of the comments that came up in one of the conversations at the Well Summit was Kay Sargent, who does a lot of, leads a lot of the neurodiversity research at HOK, saying, okay, hoteling, awful concept, right? It just, but there's something at the key of that, that if we take away, can be incredibly successful. And that is this idea of, creating a building where people can move around to work in the space where they're most productive at the time for the tasks they're doing or the meeting that they're in. So that's different than hoteling. And Interfaces building in downtown Atlanta is a good example of that. It was a bit of a, a, bit of a gamble. They chose a building to renovate across the street from a MARTA station that the square footage was smaller than what you would normally have for the population they were they wanted to have use the building. And so there weren't enough desk spaces. So what they did instead, working with Perkins and Will, was to create this amazing variety of spatial experiences. There's mystery. There are a whole variety of different refuge spaces. There are great prospect. There's they added a rooftop where you can go outside and there's a water feature and aromatic plants and views to trees across the street. They used a film on the outside of the building that's a reversed photograph of a local forest that from a distance you see the picture of the forest. When you're up close, it performs like a statistical fractal, which we know lowers people's stress. Just before the pandemic, Carnegie Mellon did a post-occupancy evaluation of the building, which was incredibly thorough. It was even temperature and air quality and acoustics and light and all of that all throughout the building, but also in-depth work with the the occupants of the building. And what they confirmed was the way that people use that building was they were moving around the building all day long to whatever space best suited what they were doing at that time. And so they wound up with a building that had the highest level of user satisfaction of any building that Carnegie Mellon has ever measured over the course of a couple decades. That was a really great outcome. And now... To have a building with all those biophilic characteristics makes it you know, an attractive place, to, still is an attractive place to be. So that idea of Incredible. using spatial variety and biophilia to create the spatial variety is a pretty important concept. And I think one that we'll really look at going forward. Will we ever get back to full occupancy mm-hmm. in offices? I don't know. I think we'll get closer and closer because... Let's face it, we're social critters, and there are things that we just, subtle clues and interactions and all that, that don't happen on Zoom. And with new people coming into a company, it's really hard to get acculturated and and understand what's going Mm -hmm. on and be mentored and all of that if it's just over over a computer screen. So I think people will come back, but I think... Cubicleville is probably not what's going to happen in the future. I, I think there's an interesting point there too, though. It's that the, the companies that are needing everyone to come back more, like they're putting more pressure on, are the ones that do require interaction and collaboration. So those are the spaces that we're really talking about too, aren't they? We're not necessarily, I mean, 
yes, your cubicle might be important, but since that's not really the type of worker that is being forced back into the, the workplace, a lot of them can do their work independently. So when it comes to those options, activity type, like variety, collaboration, it gets back to what Bill's saying. It's like those options, those space types, spatial characteristics, and, and biophilic experiences are what going to help shape what the, the office might be an attractor. Yeah. And I think what an amenity is, is changing, right? It may have been a ping pong table, and to your point, the espresso machine, but now that amenity might be better daylighting, looser configurations, and potentially access yeah. to the outdoors. Mental health experience. Um, yeah. And that's it. And I, and I love that, again, what you guys are doing are showing these positive returns, not just in a, you know, a, a straight ROI, but more these sort of direct and indirect financial impacts, which again, people can start understanding you know, the bottom line so they can implement. So talk a little bit about education, because I think it has a little bit of similar where absenteeism, you know, with kids, sick days are less, their attention is there when you bring biophilia in. Talk a little bit about some of the biomorphic patterns and textures that you bring into elementary schools and sort of some low cost interventions, which I think schools are always having a tough time with finances. So you know, what can they do to make, you know, a healthier student population? So one of the case studies in, in the new edition of Economics of Biophilia is a study that we were involved in in Baltimore looking at basically minimal interventions in a sixth grade mathematics classroom and trying to see did that help improve academic performance over the course of a school year. The interventions were basically around using biomorphic forms and fractals. So really focusing on the biomorphic forms and complexity and order patterns. And those were implemented using interface carpet tiles that had a waving prairie grass pattern. So a collinear pattern that we know lowers stress. A wallpaper freeze around the top of the classroom done by Design Tech Steelcase in partnership with neuroscientists at the Salk Institute that was a design that was an abstraction of palm leaves. So it's a biomorphic form with a collinear pattern inherent in it. So also stress reduction. Mm -hmm. Window blinds uh, replacing Venetian blinds. And so it's an east facing classroom, which meant that a lot of the time the blinds are closed because of the glare and the sunlight streaming in, almost blinding everyone. And so <laughs> replacing those Venetian blinds, which the teachers tend to just leave closed all the time, unfortunately, even though there's a garden right outside the, the second floor windows, replacing that with fabric blinds, mecho shades that had the shadow patterns of tree branches silk screened onto them. And so you have now a statistical fractal surface on one side of the room. So that also we know through the work on fractal fluency that lowers our stress as well. And so the outcomes were measured for the 125 students that use that classroom versus the 122 students who'd been in that classroom the year before with the same teacher teaching the same curriculum. And the Baltimore school system uses an online test called iReady. It's applied several times a year throughout the system. And so we were able to compare test scores between the two classes. And what we saw was over the course of the year, the educational achievement, their learning rate improved. The data got better and better over the course of the year compared to the prior year. We also did four months of biometric testing where we had a control classroom several doors down, seventh grade mathematics classroom, and we chose one period in the early afternoon, 90 minute class, and students from Morgan State University, one of the uh, partners in the experiment, came in and took measurements with the students in the classroom using a little finger sensor on heart rate variability. We did it at the beginning of class and 90 minutes later at the end of class. And what we saw in the control classroom was the numbers are pretty much the same at the end of classes as they are at the beginning of class. 
in the experimental classroom, what we saw was the numbers are better at the end of class than when they start class. Which is right. crazy. So the, the <laughs> you think they'd be stressed out. <laughs> right. So, the, right. A mathematics classroom, right? And they're coming out of the classroom with better stress recovery characteristics <laughs> than they came in. And what also was intriguing was that that number got better over time. So it's cumulative too. Interesting. Yeah. And that gets at something wow. that Stephen Kellert had said years ago about it's really important to have repeated contact and repeated experience of, of the biophilic experience. And yet we see here is evidence that, yes, I, in fact, those repeated, that repeated experience can be measured in terms of outcomes. Was sound also a part of that study? Not really. Not really. I mean, the one thing that we did change the acoustics of the classroom by putting in carpet tiles. And so in the control classroom, we put down carpet tiles in there as well, but just with a sort of basic gray pattern note, you know, just basic gray. So that the acoustics and the touch, the feel underfoot was the same in both rooms. Schools are a really interesting sector compared to some of the other chapters in, in the book because it's very distinct benefits or outcomes in the short term. And then the indirect outcomes that are more applicable to the future of the child and the family and the community. It's very distinct from the other chapters for that particular reason. For each sector, you can identify direct and indirect outcomes or benefits, but it's really interesting to start to look at what do these experiences of nature have on test scores, school satisfaction, graduation rates. You know, obviously, biophilia is not the only thing that's going to affect the child's likelihood of graduation, but if it can have a meaningful con contribution to their experience that supports graduation rates, then you talk about likelihood of matriculation to college and then long term impacts to the community with respect to either brain drain or investment and so on. You know, like you can extrapolate forever. But so the book, in many cases, will start looking at these financial translations of the science into, you know, how a community or a school or a community might think about how these decisions now might benefit us for a few years to decades beyond. It's not just that one cost. Like we can't be thinking about the cost of the blinds as being this one dollar sign. And it, you know, it just helps with glare. You know, it's not just about that. And so when we start to, when we accept that there's these long-term benefits that impact not just the individual, but the community as a whole, it's a lot easier to justify some of these interventions and costs, especially when you talk about taxpayer dollars going back into like school investments. And, and that's particularly true for the public school system, right? Like budget doing interventions like Bill was describing, they aren't necessarily there despite how small the investment actually is. It's so interesting, Katie, because I think what you and Bill are talking about too is like, it's, it's about education. So how do we educate these people, whether it be the students, the teachers, faculty, to understand the health benefits and ramifications of the nature exposure versus not? Yeah, 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 exactly, right? Policymakers, <laughs> yes. One of the numbers that, that really struck me was, you know, there's a little evidence of increased graduation rates that is like, okay, that's really nice. Well, it's actually more than really nice. A student who completes high school, on average, tends to earn $9,000 more a year than someone who didn't graduate. And so that's obviously a big number in terms of a family and income, but it, that flows through the whole community. This is helping create spaces where people are performing better and, and going to stay in school longer. That's that's a huge outcome for society. Well, I think one of the things we pulled out of the, of the book was, you know, if the U.S. graduation rate in 2015, so this is pre-pandemic, I know there's a lot of craziness going on since, but it was 80, generally 83%. And so had the graduation rate gone up to 90, from 83 to 90, the national economy would have benefited by $5.7 billion in GDP by the career midpoint for those students. So like taking that nine or 10, right, and really showing it in a long-term 
the benefits there. And I think there was another area, I, I can't remember where it was, that talked about how just putting those few dollars into the classroom, you know, really will pay back again long term in GDP that actually would cover what we're spending on education just by what we put in those small interventions, the GDP would increase and it actually would pay back again our public school funding. And so I'm curious, are you guys, I know this just came out, but are you getting calls from policymakers, from cities, from the government? Like, I just think what you've done is so important. And how does it trickle into more of these sort of policy conversations? I'm speaking at a conference for school administrators uh, later this month is Great. Sort of one of the outcomes okay. uh, to talk about what we learned. No, that's fantastic. Um, so, and we see some of the architects that we know that specialize in, in schools are definitely in these conversations with school boards. Yeah. I mean, outside of schools, there's also the, the windows. I mean, oper- whether to include operable windows has been a long term battle for a number of reasons, but just access to daylight and windows and and ventilation has kind of, I feel like it's resurfaced as a hot topic. We've written about that on our blog as well. But I know Bill has has talked to a few people about some of the policies that people are entertaining that might allow us to not have windows and bedrooms and and other places. So unfortunately, uh, there's still conversation about how to squeeze the budget or, you know, tighten, tighten expenses. And so we're trying to bring the benefits of spending that extra dollar on a window. Yes. There, yeah. Don't get me started. I went to UC Santa Barbara. That's another podcast. We won't even mention that architectural beast that got killed, the dorm, the dormzilla. But yes, it's like it is really interesting that some, I believe it was a blog on your site that talked about how some is it states or maybe the maybe the the schools themselves have their own policies where they don't have to have operable windows for dorms or they don't have to have windows, which is just like sort of mind blowing that that would be even considered. Yeah, UC Santa Barbara was able to get away with that because the land that they sit on is not subject Ridiculous. to the building local building <laughs> codes. Yeah, you know, fortunately they killed that. But that's right. The University of Texas in Austin, Austin doesn't have a code that requires windows. And so they actually built some dorms that have a number of rooms that are windowless and the rates of depression and mental health issues in those dorms is pretty frightening. The city of Honolulu is considering rewriting their code that had, you know, the old building code had basically three pages that described the requirements for daylight and natural ventilation in both bedrooms and bathrooms and quite extensive, really beautifully defined and we're in pressure from some, in particular, some developers who want to convert old, deep floor plate failed office buildings into low income housing, which means you're going to have bedrooms without windows in the core, arguing that, well, we have to have this, you know, it, we, we can just, you know, Electric lighting and electric ventilation is fine. That's all we need. And so they literally considering a code rewrite that took three pages of code and reduced it to two sentences saying that they have to have either natural or electrical lighting or natural ventilation or mechanical ventilation. And that's just absolutely frightening. And the, the fact that we would subject folks who don't have an economic choice to this is is also an, an equity issue that I find pretty offensive. The mayor of New York suggested, well, maybe we, we should adopt this, you know, which is where all these codes really started and, and where bedrooms have to have not just a window, but it has to be operable. The mayor of New York has suggested, well, maybe we can do away with that. And it's like... No, I I mean, we got into this problem when we had tenements and people not being able to get out of buildings. I mean, beyond the equity issue, there's a huge safety issue and emotional. And I mean, so again, probably a whole nother podcast. I do. I mean, seriously, I'm going to go dig, dig, dig. I'd love to like Steve Nigran is going to, I think it's San Francisco and he's staying at the one hotel, which I believe is kind of like 
I don't know if it's known for, but Jen, you and I've been to it in New York. It, you know, it's a whole series of them, but they're really known for sort of, I guess, biophilic hotel lobbies and a lot of wood usage. Just can we touch on hospitality? I loved that one note in here was sort of like, Gen Y travelers are more likely to book hotel rooms that have visual appeal on social media. Hotels hailed as being among the most Instagram worthy are also more likely to have biophilic design elements. And I just thought that was kind of fun cultural trend that you guys pulled out of there. But that's another wonderful sector and chapter is hospitality. Do you want to just touch on that for a minute? Sure. Uh, That's a fun one for us too. Yeah. Well, let's see. There's any number of ways we could talk about it. I mean, in hospitality, it tends to focus more on, or at least the, the research and the opportunity tends to focus on the communal spaces. So the lobby, the amenity, the lobbies. not as much the guest room. However, as the report notes, and some of our other reports have also highlighted that access to views, particularly views of water, but also landscape or some urban icons, like iconic architecture can get you a higher room rate. So there's that factor, but not all hotel locations have access to that. So the idea of turning your view inward and having that, like designating a preferred view is one approach that hotels can use either in the hotel room, but also in the lobby or other amenity spaces. So creating those biophilic experiences indoors. So from an economic standpoint, yes, there's the like likelihood to, to book and your total occupancy rate. But then when you're looking at the lobbies and the uh, adjacent amenities, it's rethinking the lobby as the the neighborhood living room and drawing people in and providing services and goods that will keep them there and maybe even attract locals so that they're able to increase their total revenue without having to sell more rooms. So if they're fully booked, they can increase their revenue still by having experience that attract people, draw them in, have business meetings in the lobby or, you know, dinners. But, you know, and, and we've seen that in some of our observational studies as well as some of the research. So it's really quite an exciting opportunity, especially when hotels are trying to determine, you know, they have a, even a shorter turnover rate or like remodel rate than say offices, you know, it might be 70 years or so. The opportunity is before them con- continuously to identify where those opportunities might lie to, to increase their total revenue. I think that's fascinating. Thinking about turning a hotel lobby into a communal space, which I think is brilliant, like that the community would want to go to, like you said, host a meeting or have the get together instead of just out of towners coming in. I think it's really a great looking at the bottom line for sure. Also connecting with your community. I mean, it adds that connection, I think is particularly valuable when you're trying to fortify your relationship and your standing in the community and how you're valued and that opportunity to connect with local artists and cultures and things like that. So, yeah, I think it goes far deeper than what we're talking about, but. Uh, we could talk for an hour about hospitality. Yes. <laughs> we can I know, I know. <laughs> and I know we're running short on time, but I really, i also want to talk about the retail sector yeah. Um, because this is one that I spent 25 years of my life in retail, and I've always been fascinated by how do we engage people. And I'm curious to find out about, so just about dwell time, what anything that changed versus the first studies you were doing with retail and now that you were surprised about? Well, in the time since we wrote the original, one of the research techniques has really emerged pretty strongly, and that's the use of gaze attention actually tracking people's eyes to see what they're looking at when they're looking at a storefront or inside a store. And it's been used for retail placement for a while, more so than almost any other branch of building design. And what we find is that if there are biophilic elements, the eye will go to that. And it increases the likelihood, if they're in a shop window, that people will actually go into the shop And there seems to be some evidence that they'll stay in the shop longer. And of course, the basic Hmm. theory being the longer I can keep you in the shop, the more likely you are to buy something. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's great. Is there is there any particular vegetation or just regular plants or green walls? Like what are you guys seeing in the retail? Like anything innovative that's happening? One of the intriguing studies was they put a fish tank 
in a window, which had nothing to do with anything being sold in the store, but it dramatically increased the number of folks who would stop, look in the window, and then go in the store. But we do see brands that really create really intriguing retail spaces, not just using plantings and green walls and all that, although we have seen some do really beautiful that, but also three-dimensional experiences and elements. Restaurant in in Hong Kong has a wall of these wood blocks that are printing blocks from Bali. So they're for printing fabric, but the patterns on them are leaves and flowers and that. So you see the wood grain, you see the wood, but you also see these beautiful flowers and leaves and stuff on the wall. It's just absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, with retail, the research is a little trickier because nobody's tracking the financial benefit, or very few are tracking the financial benefit of including plants or biomorphic form, other biophilic elements. There are a few examples that do, but then when you change over and you remodel, there's no comparison from the old example. So, you know, the, I think the opportunity really lies in looking at multiple locations of a single brand, perhaps, you know, how does this store perform versus that store? But you have to think about demographics and location and like, there's a lot of variables, but when you have a, a large franchise or, you know, when there's multiple shops in a single city, like you can start to see where the trends and the behaviors are. One of my favorite examples of biophilic retail is Aesop. Now, oh my God, I was just going to bring, yes. <laughs> I, was I, don't just, even, I just wrote that down. I was like, I yeah, love this. I don't <laughs> know if they actively choose to use biophilic design, but I know Snowheda is one of their architects and they do use biophilic design in some of their projects. So, but if you see their spaces, they're all extremely different, but each of them has some quality, but they, they're the spatial conditions, the lighting, the forms of the space, um, the materials. So it's a really fascinating comparison of one store in one country compared to another country. And I don't have any data on how those stores perform compared to, say, their competition. But just I, being able to see it next to the biophilic design patterns, like re it's really cool. Yeah, a lot of wood. I'll have to find the article. I don't know if it was in Dwell or Dezine or something, but it did start to talk about they're very place-based and intentional, to your point, about that architecture. And I am so drawn to them. And one of the things that I think is brilliant that they do, and I don't know if we'd call this a biophilic, but I guess it's a smell, is even when the store's closed, they usually have pumps outside the store that you can sample. You know, and the smells of it are so beautiful and the tactile quality of just putting on that lotion or something I don't know. I, I love that you brought that up, Katie, because those are some of my favorite. Like, it's just sort of a, a really special place. And, you know, Jen, when you were doing Beauty Bar, the wood that you used and the green that you used and the plants versus your, like, what you and I talk about, some of these traditional, like, oh, it's a beauty thing. It's <laughs> nesty, um, little chandeliers and pink, pink and glitzy. Pink and, and glitters. Yeah. And um, so I, and, you know, I think Credo, you know, we've had Annie on, I think her stores do that. A lot of wood grain, they're very inviting and they bring you in. But, but I love what you said, just tying back to the wood grain and the Bali is that it doesn't have to be a green. It doesn't have to be a plant, meaning what we think of as green, the wood grain, like I'm sitting at a table right now and it's a wood grain, it's like a tree, you know, cut and polished. It's so important, right? I mean, you did that whole story on, you know, so much research on wood. It's incredible. It's just that can have a difference for you. Yeah. And retail is really fun, you know, because you use the space to message about what's important about your brand. The earliest research, of course, then on all of these topics was healthcare, going back to Roger Ulrich's study. Yeah of patient recovery. And one of the things that you forget in the economics of, of hospitals is everyone goes, oh, well, you know, if I've got a patient in a room X number of days, that's generating all this income. Well, actually, they generate more income by doing the actual operations and, and the support on that. And yes, they generate income off the room, but if they can't turn the rooms over and and have more operations. So 
getting people to increasing patient turnover is is a really good thing for the economics. And so if I can get you out of the hospital a day earlier, that's fantastic for both yourself and also for the economics of the hospital. And that's yeah. <laughs> one of the things we see. The others that we see and what we really saw in the pandemic was the impact on the staff. And so one of the case studies we include is Mirel Phillips from Studio Elsewhere doing what she calls recharge rooms, which are immersive biophilic experiences, a 15-minute experience for hospital staff. And some of the data that was shared from us and measurements that were done at Mount Sinai indicated that the staff having repeat experiences of that space over the course of time, that the results for the staff got progressively better and better and better, and definitely dramatic reduction in stress, but also there's some evidence that it helped with retention as well. And staff retention in hospitals is like everything at this point. Yeah, no, so, so, so important. And I think if I recall, that was sort of just like almost a happenstance, right? Because these tents that they had brought in that were extra space for COVID patients, am I correct? They then were, thank God, we moved the COVID patients out. We, people were getting healthier, you know, or, or whatever. The, the numbers were coming down in New York. So they still had those spaces. So they repurposed them. Is that correct, Bill? Well, the original one was a, yeah, yeah, the original one was a storage room. But they wound up installing these in a variety of different settings in more than 60 hospitals across the country. Mm. So it wasn't just Mount Sinai, but it was mm, a wow. bunch of different hospitals Very all over cool. the place and different settings. Well, I know, Jen, you've done tent pop-ups like that for years for different brands and clients. And it's really interesting how that's more and more people, I feel like, are wanting that. We were having a conversation with Nordstrom's the other day and, you know, how, just to tie retail back in, but just how their staff could be recharged in a space is really interesting to think about kind of tying it all back into sort of a business setting, a retail setting of these healthcare. All of these people benefit from these incredible experiences, whether it's a picture of nature, the sounds of nature. I wake up every morning to my little apple birds on my, that's my alarm and just makes me happier <laughs> than, than like that want, want, you know, right. It starts your day yeah. off. Yeah, I think you have a good point, though, because we are often in design conversations, the tendency is to focus on the primary audience, right? So the customer, the patient, mm -hmm. the front of house worker. Meanwhile, the teachers, the back of house staff, yeah. the cleaning crew, whatever, they're resigned to these potentially windowless spaces that just have like a microwave and some plastic chairs <laughs> right. and I think yeah. that's a lot more common than we realize because we don't see it right. mm -hmm. and so it's just that extra space that we that, that is allocated for that purpose and I think we need to to remember that their experience their workplace ex I mean it's not an office experience but it is a workplace experience mm -hmm. so there's still benefits to the individual and the company and the client to provide similar experiences for them as well and you start to see that in certain building types where, you know, the amenities are shared with the staff or there is a similar option, like at hospitals, there might be a staff space that is separate, the community garden, so that they can actually relax without being inundated by requests from patients and things like that. And I also want to make a point that like a lot of what we've talked about today has been financial because I know, that, I mean, I know the metrics are sort of sometimes what you have to have. I mean, it's obviously important to show the metrics and the ROI, but the health impacts and the well-being impacts are so important. And those are the things that you've been seeing for years. And now we're sort of being able to quantify them in a way that hopefully will make further change. I want to be mm -hmm. like really clear because sometimes it feels very transactional. <laughs> I, I see biophilia as this like beautiful organic, I mean, no pun or, you know, and really wanting to like let our listeners know that it's a balance. You want to have people to sort of not think about it as this squishy idea. And so, you know, you've got to bring the numbers to the table and the outcomes to the table. And so I appreciate all the research you guys do and then the compilation of the research. And unfortunately, the world is based on GDP. So we've got to bring those numbers to the table. But I do hope that, and I see the glimmer and I see people you know, really recognizing 
the well-being of my team and my staff and my customers, to your point, are more important than the financial, but we have, there's still banks, you know, we're still getting loans. We have to sort of balance it. So I struggle with that a lot personally. One of the concepts that came up when we were doing the research on community was this idea called urban patriotism. And it's a term we'd never heard before, but it's essentially being proud of where you are, being proud of the physical community that you're located in and that biophilia can be a really strong way to increase that feeling of, I like where I am and I'm proud of this. And that's separate from demographics and income that is achievable with biophilic design in a lot of different places. And that was one of the pieces that for us came up was this idea of urban patriotism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a cool term. I like that a lot. One of the things, because, you know, parks are so important and, you know, we have great friends at Biophilic Cities and bringing green into a city or a community is so important. And one of the points, and even in the retail, I think study, it said if there were just trees on the street in front of the place, in front of the retail, that helped with bringing people in. But I think it was the Center for American Progress found that you can actually have a reduction in violent crime, which is a very different benefit through increasing the urban tree canopy. And so thinking about that benefit and, again, trying to talk to our policymakers, community, city council, mayors, investing more in our parks and investing more in our green space, and at the same time, making sure that they're not being cut down, like they're really thinking about when development does come in, how we're treating those trees or saving those trees. And the money that can be saved, again, by reducing crime, and I think it was the Chicago research, you know, what if we put those dollars back into the parks? And it just became this wonderful cycle. So talk about that a little bit, Katie. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see for policymakers to use this and similar resources as a basis for policy that prioritizes buildings and urban spaces and parks as instruments for public health. So it's not just about reducing crime, but if you can reduce crime, you can reallocate those tax dollars to something else. Yep. But you're also, say, improving the asthma or like reducing asthma and then, you know, the proximity to parks. It, it'd be, like, it's just, it continues on. That ripple effect. Yeah, it, it's just this ripple effect, domino effect, however you want to frame it. But we need policy to actually put the fire under people to really embrace it at that scale. But for business leaders, you know, we're already seeing this, but just for them to look more at the long game for their investments, mm-hmm. you know, there's certain business leaders or real estate holders that, that will hold their buildings for a long time, but other ones don't. And so if they can look at the long game, because health benefits have a long term, you know, value, they're not necessarily seen within the period of in which you build the building. So, you know, from the opening day onward. It's often overlooked in the project budgeting and value engineering process. So Mm -hmm. I think the ones that are benefiting are the ones who actually hold their properties longer. But, you know, for people who don't, their business model isn't like that. It doesn't mean that they can't embrace it because, I mean, imagine if developer adopts this practice, they are going to be presumably better regarded as a good steward of public health and community building and we'll be hired for another project. Like it's just, you're creating goodwill by doing that. Mm-hmm. It will get you more jobs. And that's my personal opinion. I don't have the science behind that, but yeah, this is valuable to business leaders as well as policymakers. I hope to see it used that way. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's anything we haven't covered. I'm, I mean, again, I could talk to you guys for hours. I sort of said that at the top. I'm like, I don't think we're going to be able to do 45 <laughs> minutes and we're at an hour, but I think it's all oh, no. uh, wonderful conversation. And we highly encourage everybody to pick up the book. Where can we find it? How can we support it? What, what can we do to share and support the education? So we want, first, we want to thank Interface for helping to sponsor the publication. Great. Um, and the easiest way for people to access it is to go to terpinbrightgreen.com okay. and go to our publication section and you'll find it there. And great. Download it for free. Which is another great thing, by the way. So thank you to Interface for making it free, right? And thank you for all the hard work because it doesn't 
books just don't appear out of nowhere. Like you guys worked really hard on doing this, I'm sure. And so thank you guys for putting it together because if we don't have the research and the data to back it up, then it just becomes exactly. like a gobbledygook word by Phil Design, you know? <laughs> yeah. Bill, Katie, thank you so much for your time. A lot of it today. We would like to have more of it, but for now, this has been fantastic and yeah. so informative for not only just Monica and myself, but all of our listeners. So we really appreciate it. Yeah. We always love hanging out with you guys. Thank you both for having us. Thanks for the opportunity. All right, Jen, once again, I could have chatted with them for an hour or more easily. You know, we barely scratched the surface of everything in this new report, but I'm really excited it's out there into the world freely too, which is really, I think, an important aspect. It's a free report. I couldn't agree more with all of that. So just right off the bat, I want to point out that this report covers the economy in pretty broad terms. So each one of the categories explores the health outcomes, looks at how that translates into financial benefits, and then provides really detailed case studies as examples. Yeah. When you say broad terms, you know, there are examples like offices and retail spaces, which are merely making the case for businesses who care about the bottom line to bring biophilia into those verticals. You know, on the other hand, we have examples like community and education, which explore the benefits from a taxpayer and GDP perspective. The whole report is really expertly done. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more, as always. <laughs> so, but I love the compounding effect of all of this as well. Like if we can plant more trees along a busy city street or open a new park, there's real evidence showing it's good for retail, it can reduce crime, improve public health, and you're saving money that can otherwise be allocated towards education and infrastructure and et cetera, et cetera, it goes on and on. Yeah, you know, and I really think that like Bill and Katie would be the first ones to point out. There are so many factors that go into, say, for example, a high crime area. So biophilic design isn't the solution, but it is a tool that we have. And the evidence is pretty clear. It can be really powerful and have a lot of positive ripple effects. Absolutely. Bill also mentioned a few times that implementing biophilic design solutions is an investment. So sometimes you're not necessarily saving costs from the onset, but I think the outcomes really speak for themselves in so many ways. Well, and Jen, that gets back to the long-term versus short-term thinking, which we discuss so often on the podcast. Mm -hmm. It certainly does come back to that all the time. Yep. So long-term thinking people, we can't emphasize it enough. And we'll keep saying it over and over again. Okay, so you can find the Economics of Biophilia, second edition, on the Terrapin Bright Green website. But we've also linked it along with several other publications from Bill, Katie, and their colleagues. So please dive in in our show notes. All very much worth the read. And pass it along to the policymakers and decision makers in your life as well. All right. Until next time, Jen. Bye, Monica. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to follow us on your favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating and please leave us a review. It really goes such a long way towards helping us reach a wider audience and sharing these amazing interviews and solutions with the world. Absolutely. So thanks so much for following and reviewing the podcast. And we'll be back with another amazing interview in two weeks. You're now a part of the biophilic movement. 